Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual tour brought to you by Region 9 and the Kemp Center for the Arts with support from the Pretty Foundation. Today, we're heading out to the Circle Trail to catch up with MSU geology professor Dr. Jonathan Price and some of his students where we will be discussing how to read the landscape for its history so that we can better portray it in our artwork. Dr. Price, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Kevin. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we certainly appreciate your time. I want to jump right in with a quote from Leonardo da Vinci. He said, the painter who draws merely by practice and by eye, without any reason, is like a mirror which copies everything placed in front of it without being conscious of their existence. You have a comment on that quote? Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting quote because I think the part of that is truly artistry is processing what you're seeing and trying to relay that to anybody else who would want to look at it. And we do a little of that in science, but not to the extent that you would do as an artist. But we are trying to communicate. So when we make a drawing or even a well-written paragraph, we're hoping that the people that come along and look at it are seeing something that we saw. And that's a real important part in both art and science, to be able to communicate what you're trying and to feel and think and, and experience to someone else. Well, I like that comment about trying to communicate what you're feeling. That's pretty neat. Give us a sense of where you are and who you have with you today. All right, I'd love to. I've got two of my uh, best students with me today. Uh, this is Jared Steger. Jared's an undergraduate, and he's uh, getting close to finishing his degree at Midwestern State University. And he's a geology major and interested in the kind of rocks that come from volcanoes and how crystals form. And on my left here, this is Amber Cueve. Amber finished her degree last year at Midwestern, but she stuck around to pursue a master's of science. So she's working on her graduate degree she, too, is interested in the kind of rocks you get from volcanoes, and her project's actually on a volcano in central Oregon. And they may answer a couple wow. of the questions that you have for me today. So, That sounds great. Well, let's start kind of broad. I have a quote here that says, Each inch in depth of rock covers a 1,000-year time period. I know that's fairly broad, but is that a good general rule of thumb? It's not a bad rule of thumb because it gives you the sense of scale you're dealing with in geology. I think one of the toughest things that students have to learn about geology and earth science is the phenomenal amount of time that it represents. It is so divorced from the human experience. And in a lot of ways, there are parallels that way to both arts and science. You have to, to jump out of your own experience sometime and expand how you're looking at the world. And that's one way that we do it in geology. We look at rocks like these and say, all right, this represents a phenomenally large period of time to you and I. But geologically, it's a very short period of time. And getting used to that takes some time to get comfortable. Yeah, I imagine that's really kind of an interesting brain challenge there. So if we're talking about you know, an inch for a 1,000 years and you're there looking at a rock or even a cliff with maybe a bunch of different layers, you're talking about a long period of time. What do you do to process that? Do you have to kind of take it in little bitty sections? Well, I've, if I understood your question correctly, processing it really comes down to trying to envision what's going on with the rocks. And we have a helpful tool for that. These rocks are pretty old. They're 270 million years old. But they're responding to the same influences that we see going on right behind us in the Wichita River Valley. We call that uniformitarianism, or the present is a key to the past. In other words, these are river sands, and we can tell that by looking at them. So if we process them, looking at them as a series of deposits, laid down over the aeons by sands accumulating, then we start to reflect on what's actually driving the system and what it can tell us about the greater region at that time. So the location that you are in now is a new section of the trail, and I will kind of throw myself under the bus and say I snuck in there not too long ago before it was officially open, but can you give us a sense of this as far as 
is it a good place? Or it looked to me like a really good place for people to go and, and study geology. Uh, it's a great place to experience geology in Wichita Falls. Wichita Falls is buried mostly under younger sediments that were laid down within the last 500,000 years, which sounds, again, like a long period of time, but that's not in Earth history. So if you want to look at the old rocks that are the foundation of Wichita Falls, you really need to come out here where the river has exposed them all along the bluff, here and in Lucy Park. Those are great places along the Seymour Highway. You'll see the same rock there, this brown to blackish looking sandstone is what we call it, which is just made up of particles of sand laid down by a river a very long time ago. So I am told that that section that you are in is part of an old, millions and millions of years old riverbed, but that river originally went from east to west. Now, we all know that the Wichita River goes west to east, so you're sort of blowing my mind here. Yeah, so it wouldn't be exactly the same river because it would have been a river that existed a long time ago. But the directionality we can read from the rocks. And I'm actually going to let Amber talk a little bit about how you learn which way rocks are telling you which way the river flows. You want to take that one? All right. <laughs> Um, I think what Dr. Price is trying to get me to talk about is the fact that we can look at ripple patterns, such as the rocks that we've got here, and we can tell which way the water's flowing based on the ripples, um, such as like here. Um, because the rivers we have now obviously put down and leave marks on the land, and we can use basically the same idea that the river is using now to look at these rocks from the past. So, Dr. Price, I'm guessing Amber can't hear me. Can you relay a question and just ask her broadly first, how did she become interested in rocks? Uh, how did she get interested in rocks? Did I hear it co correctly? Yes. Okay, she'll tell you. So, I got interested in geology because I started out um, as an engineering major and I switched to environmental science because I was interested in the earth sciences and um, the idea of working outdoors. And I took a physical geology class um, at, at Midwestern State University and got hands-on with the rocks and learned that, hey, I can use these to learn something about the past of our Earth to see what was going on here previously by using, you know, just small stones that we were given in class. So I thought that was really interesting. And, I mean, granted, we use that now for finding petroleum, et cetera. So it can be applied in a lot of areas. So I found that extremely interesting. So Amber's a student now. What does she want to be doing five years from now? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Amber is a student now. What does she hope to be doing five years from now? Oh, that's a powerful question. I will ask her that one. What do you <laughs> hope to be doing in five years from now? I hope to be done. I'm currently working on my master's. I hope to be finishing my uh, PhD, actually. And, and what career path would that lead her to? What career path will that lead you to? Um, I've got options. So I'm interested at coming back and teaching at the college level. Um, I'm currently helping teach a few classes now. Um, but I'm also definitely interested in research, doing research for universities, um, or possibly running my own lab with equipment. I'm definitely interested in uh, a lot of the um, bigger machines that we use to analyze rocks. Um, I'm super interested in learning how they work, so I'd also be interested in maybe running my own lab. Well, let's keep this thread going. Now, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of your other colleague there, but if you could tell me that and ask him why he's interested in rocks. I will do that. Jared, what got you interested in rocks? Well, what got me interested in geosciences was um, starting out with uh, physical geology. I found out that uh, I kind of had a knack for naming some of the minerals and stuff as we went through that uh, class. When we got into uh, the classes above that, mineralogy and petrology, I found out that that's really stuff that I love. I love looking at the makeup of rocks. I love looking at the crystal forms of rocks. And ever since then, it's just kind of clicked into place like that. And how about his career path then, Dr. Price? 
Sure. What's your career path? <laughs> well, I'm hoping that uh, later on, after I only have a few more classes left, I'm hoping to be able to go on for my master's, hopefully at Midwestern. Um, and then I'd like to also uh, do a research-oriented uh, job style if I can get it. Um, deep Earth exploration is something that I'm pretty interested in as well. So, Great. Thanks to both of them. It's interesting to listen to both of them, and maybe you can comment since you see, since you see Dr. Price so many students, but clearly there's something inside each of them and you that has a passion for geology and rocks. And, and I find that kind of interesting as opposed to somebody who, I don't know, might just take a more traditional career path as a, a banker or an insurance agent or something like that, which are great careers, but there's something inside that is drawing the three of you to geology. I agree, uh, and I think the thing inside is curiosity, and it's something that we share even with a diversity of, of different professions. If you have that question that's burning in you on how, how does this work, or how did this come to be, or you know, how even could I represent this so somebody else could see what I'm seeing, those are, are the fuel, if you will, for propelling you to ask further questions and to remain interested in what you're doing. So that, I think that level of interest is fostered in geology quite a bit because the Earth is somewhat in, enigmatic. It's difficult to deal with. As I like to say, we have this superpower that we can see back in time and see into the Earth. Earth the Earth is largely opaque and hidden to us in terms of time. And if you nurture that, if you're curious, if you ask the next step like, okay, I understand this, what got, came before that, what's uh, the story behind the next thing down, uh, that's the kind of fuel that propels a geologist. So let's talk about Wichita County then for a second. What are the top two or three coolest things as far as geology about Wichita County? Well, Wichita County, as I like to say, is actually in one of the most important regions in North American geology for one specific reason, and that is that we're here at about 270 million years. And if we go up in time, and you can drive west of here and go up in time in terms of the rocks, you're going to come to the end of this geologic period known as the Permian. At the end of the Permian, everything dies. The worst mass extinction we ever had on this planet. 93 to 97% of species were decimated at that time. Uh, we really don't know the cause of it, so looking at rocks like this inform us about what the Earth was doing before this cataclysmic part of its history, where things are going to greatly change in terms of the fossils we can see and what's going to happen to Earth's systems as we move forward. So I think Wichita County kind of has this unique position where we get to see this diversity of rocks that were laid down on the continent that was here at that time, that tells us quite a bit about not only what's going to happen in terms of the end of life, but what's happening with life here. One of the important fossil finds that we find around Wichita County is these large finback organisms, dimetrodons. They kind of get grouped into the dinosaurs, but they're not dinosaurs. And they're a fabulous fossil. They're about lion size. Complete fossil expressions are found west of here near Seymour. They've been taken to the Smithsonian. These are wonderful things, and we, cl we hold those as, you know, our local fossils. That, that is the exciting stuff that's happening here in Wichita County. Now, you said something that really piqued my interest. Now, obviously, you're talking about a lot of history here, but you said you can look at rocks and geology and figure out the future? Yeah, you know, there, there's some, a little bit of, of that to it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it would be easy to do, but there, if we look at the modern rock processes and we keep in mind what the planet has been through in the past, we sort of know the range of what's possible. So you can't see the future per se, but you can certainly speak to the fact of what will happen to the Wichita Valley as it progresses over time. You could talk about what's gonna happen to this hill slope over time. And more importantly, Kevin, what's important to the homeowners across the way in terms of, of land slope stability 
and whether or not uh, you know the soils will stick around for a long time. Those are questions that we can certainly answer with geology because we have both the view of what the Earth is capable of in its path, past, and we know the processes that are ongoing today and can understand them. So what are we in for in Wichita County in a million years from now? What should we be prepping for? Well, that, that again is a tough question because a million years will not actually change us that much here. But what will happen is that the Wichita River behind us, and we have a lawnmower coming up the way, but the Wichita <laughs> River behind us is going to move around as it has in the past. So we won't see it in the same place that we see it today. And it's probably going to eventually undermine the slope. In other words, we will probably be talking to you a million years from now a little bit further back on the same kind of hillside. Not that I expect to be around that long, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about the rocks behind you and the slope, we've kind of, kind of talked briefly about them. What other cool things can we uh, see right behind you there? Sorry, Kevin, I lost you there. We had a little bit of extraneous noise with the lawnmowers. I'm, I'm hoping that your future sees no lawnmowers as well. I'm kind of done with mine, uh, but as we go forward uh -huh. and, we look, <laughs> and we look at what's behind you, you've talked briefly about the rocks and the slope there. What other, what other things are we seeing right in that area there that are of note? Well, I think what's important is what the river is doing and what it's capable of. And we know that, right? Uh, particularly you as a meteorologist are aware of that and are, are looking for signs that, you know, there might be uh, hazards coming down our way. The river's capable of holding only so much water. So a couple of years back when we finally broke the drought and we had all, all those rainfalls, we have to ask the question about where is the water going to go when it comes downstream? And those are answerable questions, but it takes a considerable amount of study, not only about the surface, but what the rocks are capable of holding. A good sandstone like this actually is about 25% holes. In other words, there's space in here for water. We need to ask the question, okay, well, how much water can you hold and where will you take it once you hold it? And these are important questions when we want to consider whether or not a certain neighborhood will flood or a certain uh, part of the river will be able to balance the sediments that are coming down. We learn that by paying attention to the current rocks, the nature of the Wichita River, and thinking about what the rocks around it are doing. So you may be thinking, we hadn't discussed this previously, but now you may be thinking a little east of Wichita County and the Lake Ringgold project. That's a geology project as well, right? Because you can't really just go dig a hole or redirect the river and expect that that water is going to stay there. Is that fair? That is correct. So you have to be careful to survey in the land surface. So as an engineer, you would approach that and say, do we have the basin we need for the water? And then as a geologist, you have to ask the questions, is the water going to stay where we think it is? Is there transport of water underground that we don't know about? And since it would be a new project, the Lake Ringel project wouldn't have had water uh, caught in a basin there. That's going to apply all sorts of pressures to the geology that needs to be assessed properly before it's fully implemented. But uh, it's important from a water point of view to have enough water resources. And one of the things we know about the Wichita River behind us is it's a big river that goes way back into, geologic, uh, into the geologic structure and hits these deposits from an ocean that was present back there and makes it full of gypsum as a consequence of it. So the water is more saline and it's less pleasant to drink and it's harder on the plants. Whereas the Little Wichita River, which feeds our current lake reservoirs, Kickapoo and Arrowhead, and eventually Lake Ringgold, that's a fresher water system because it does not go back as far into the geology. It doesn't go as far west or into these deposits that were laid down by the sea. That's nice, but it's also a smaller river system, so that has a trade-off there. We only catch what we can catch in terms of rainfall in that basin. Those are fascinating comments about an, a, a new lake project. How about we swing to an old lake project, Lake Wichita? My understanding is it's about 100 years old, give or take, and it's been filling up with silt, and that has caused a problem. But that's geology too, right? you have any comments on Lake Wichita? That's correct. Uh, in fact, that is the fate of all lakes. Uh, 
we only have one natural lake in the state of Texas. The rest are uh, artificial impoundments made by damming uh, streams. And eventually, lakes fill up with silt. You can't stop it. It's the, the course of what a lake basin will do. So to improve the nature of, say, Lake Wichita, so that the, you have adequate fish biota, that you have adequate interaction for people who want to, to uh, interact with the lake, uh, you do need to remove some of the accumulated silt, and you need to plan upstream and say, how can we prevent it from filling up so fast? So I think some of the important geological questions there are, are what is the water going to do if you dredge down into the lake? And what will we do upstream in order to control sediments coming into the lake? Let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about geology and artwork. And you can also tell Jared, God bless you. Yes, Jared, God bless you. <laughs> we got it on camera. <laughs> how, how about geology in artwork? Initial comments there? Yeah, um, the, there's of course the natural um, the, the natural tendency for artists to want to express the world around them in a variety of natures, uh, and looking at the geology has certainly been one of the principal drivers uh, in in painting, uh, in photography, uh, in trying to capture what the artist is actually seeing in the landforms around them. Uh, it's a tough trick to do, and of course, uh, you want to want to pay respect to what you're seeing in the rocks. As a geologist, I do a little bit of sketching myself to try to capture what I think I'm seeing in it. I'm no artist, but I can convey to myself and maybe a few other people what I saw that was important. I think in the same way in art, in art, what you're trying to do is convey something that's important to you. And if it's the landscape around you, if it's the rocks and, the, and what the rocks are doing and the water, then that's an important facet of it. And you may not be aware of what's happening geologically, but you're certainly aware of your surroundings. And that's actually the first step to doing geology. You have to be aware of what you're looking at. And I think in that way, there's a lot of synthesis between art and science in being observant, imagining what's there and what's missing. We've got a lot of stuff that isn't shown here, but I have a good idea where this rock went 270 million years ago. I know what the river looked like at that time, and that's all up in my head in the same way an artist might approach a landscape and say, what's the best way to represent this in terms of light and color and context for what I'm seeing and what I feel in my emotions? So it's interesting you said that you do do some sketching, uh, I guess to maybe document your work, remind yourself what you're seeing, but you, you could just use photographs. Why are you sketching? Yeah, if I understood you correctly, uh, and we do use quite a bit of photographs, I'd like to reference one of my professors, though. He, he says, you, he told me a long time ago that a photograph will give you whatever the light is giving you that day, uh, and it will give you at the light of that time of day, and it will miss some of the things that you really wanted to point out to people. So like these very fine beds over here, these are all laid down by individual influxes of the river. I might be able to capture that pretty well with my camera, particularly the way the shadows are stacking today. It could be more powerful as a sketch. And then, of course, on the sketch, you know, it's easily annotated. I don't have to go to software or anything. I can just put in a pencil mark so that even if you don't understand what I'm drawing, which is highly likely, it says ripple mark shows direction of water flow. That's powerful information I just conveyed in a very short amount of time. And that, of course, is a beautiful thing in both science and art. To convey something powerful in a short amount of time really it allows us to move forward quite quickly. I imagine then taking the time to sketch something maybe gives you a greater connection as opposed to just snapping a picture. Oh, I agree. You have to process it, right? So when you do um, any kind of art that involves your hand, you know, either touching or involving a, a drawing or a painting, you have to plan that out. It's not accidental. and. Uh, Amber likes to say that erasers are important in geology because uh -huh. the first time through is probably not going to be right either. So, uh, and that's that's much more powerful than just snapping a picture. Maybe it'll speak to you later, but you will not have the same kind of appreciation 
for what you valued and what you were seeing. And I think that also resonates through art. You're trying to express what you value with every line stroke on a painting or any line stroke on a, a sketch, that that was what you were thinking needed to be said about it. How about your friends there? We'll talk to Amber first. Does she have, how does she incorporate artwork into her work? Okay. She can't hear me. Go ahead and put the. Oh. <laughs> oh, hi, Amber. Nifty over here. Can you hear me? Hey. Hey, I'm sorry. This is Kevin. I was just going to have him relay the question, but since we were talking about artwork, I was going to ask you and Jared, do you incorporate artwork into your work in some way? Um, as far as using art in our work? Yeah. Is that what? Okay, yeah. So, um, actually, one of the classes I'm helping teach right now is called Structural Geology. And a large part of that class is learning to understand what's going on beneath your feet in the ground and then being able to draw an accurate, um, not necessarily a sketch, but a picture of what's going on. So keeping in mind, like, how thick the rocks are, what the rocks would look like, um, what kind of structures we see down there. Do we see faulting or um, some kind of folding under there? So being able to accurately um, show that in that picture is actually a very big part of um, the class we're working on and a lot of the classes in general. And I'll let you interview Jared. Ask him the same question. Um, he's basically asking if uh, if we art is a big part in uh, geology and what we do. I would say yes, definitely. Uh, just like she was mentioning, uh, structural is very, very uh, diagram intensive, and you have to have everything to scale. You have to uh, be able to tr keep track of everything that you're uh, trying to sketch and be sure that other people can see it as well. Um, this also goes for uh, classes like mineralogy. It, uh, you have to be able to uh, visualize exactly what a particular crystal of a mineral is going to do. Uh, some of the beginning of the class is actually just looking at different crystal forms, not actual crystals, but just the forms, and um, taking into account uh, you know, symmetry, all this other stuff, and then being able to draw a diagram showing... Uh, how how I don't know I don't know how to describe that. Doing. Yeah, how, how what, what the mineral's doing exactly. So very good, yeah. thank you both. Amber, you can pass that back to Dr. Price. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Price, all minerals have color, but not all minerals are good for using color in artwork. <laughs> is that correct? This is true. So um, colored minerals are important for artwork. Uh, because they're one of the, the backbones of, of trying to get brilliant colors, particularly in paints and pigments of all kinds. And uh, it's not news to us. I mean, we're using these still today. But uh, these were known, uh, you know, to the ancients. Uh, for example, you, the, the picture of the Egyptian paint box uh, that I saw um, that, that was passed on to me, that, that speaks to it. I'm fully aware that Native Americans... Uh, utilized a lot of rock materials for a lot of their pigmentation as well. And uh, not every colored mineral will give you something that you could use as a pigment for a number of reasons. Mostly what you seek in a pigment mineral is something that's soft uh, and will probably form a pretty good pigment on its own. In other words, when you break it down in your fingers or you break it down, uh, you know, just by lightly grinding it, it stays put, it smears, it, it does things like, you know, like... Um, well, chalk does when it's colored, and all chalk is is a natural material, uh, calcium carbonate, and then they add a synthetic color to it. Same idea, you can find rock materials that do that very naturally. And if you add binders uh, or, or oils to it and it stays in solution in those oils, that's useful as well. Some materials are just too hard. They may be pretty as, a, as an entire crystalline specimen, but it turns out that when you break them apart, they just turn into rough sands that you can't adhere to anything. Or more likely that when you break it down, it loses the, the color that you thought was so intense as a whole specimen. So a lot of, of minerals are quite like that. They have a lot of color when they're thick and not so much color when they're thin. 
So uh, I would say that a lot of pigmentation is, has uh, arisen by trial and error, but it's still very important for the modern paints industry, both in the artist world and in household paints. Uh, minerals are an important backbone for getting color into a lot of substances. But I'm told that some are actually dangerous. Something called orpiment is hazardous to you? Yes, this is true. I'm going to hand this one off to Jared because he loves talking about minerals. But <laughs> orpiment is a very dangerous mineral, and perhaps he'll share some of his favorite dangerous minerals with you. Great. <laughs> so, yeah, um, in a lot of old paints, uh, people used to use uh, minerals like orpiment, rutile, cinnabar, all these other, uh, you know, nowadays we know are dangerous minerals. Um, but they have very, very bright hues. They, uh, they keep well in, uh, for paints and everything. They don't smear very often or whatever. Um, but if you look into the mineral itself, rutile and orpiment, you know, they're bright red and bright yellow, but they are an arsenic mineral, and arsenic is very, very poisonous. Um, same thing with cinnabar. Cinnabar is actually a, uh, the, uh, Elemental mercury, uh, it, that's its ore mineral. And mercury is a heavy metal, and it is very, very toxic. Um, and then you also have some other minerals which have these really, really bright hues but aren't as toxic as long as you don't, like, eat them. Like, for instance, malachite. Malachite is a, uh, is a copper mineral, makes a beautiful green color, and I, it's been used in paint before, I think. Um, but as long as you don't eat it, it's not terribly bad for you. <laughs> So, but uh, it really just kind of goes hand in hand with uh, research, just learning what minerals and what uh, elements are bad for you. <laughs> and Dr. Price, if you could ask Jared further then, there, are there some telltale signs that uh, certain things are dangerous? And, you know, I mean, when you think about a kid playing in the sand there where you are, if the parents are out taking a walk, are there certain signs that say, wait a second, you probably shouldn't put that in your mouth, even though a kid may do it anyway? Uh, I will ask him, are there telltale signs to know if something is dangerous? Particularly if you're unexperienced and you came across a rock, how would you know not to put it in your mouth? Do you have any <laughs> put it in your mouth. Um, well, if it's, uh, it, it has to do with texture, color, uh, you know, there, there are quite a few telltale signs. Normally, if you see something brightly colored in, uh, in the world, like uh, brightly colored animals usually, those are normally poisonous, and you don't want to put those in your mouth. So usually if you see a very, very bright colored mineral that looks powdery or something, you don't really want to mess with it. Um, another uh, thing to look for is, uh, like I mentioned before, texture. Uh, one of the main minerals that I bring up for this is things like um, minerals with uh, um, asbestos form, asbestos. Um, those look really cool. They're really... Uh, you know, feathery, wispy, uh, fibrous looking minerals. But if you breathe them, it's very, very bad for you. <laughs> Dr. Price, let's shift a little again into maybe a point of controversy here. We're going to look at a picture. It is called A Sierra Nevada Morning by Albert Bierstadt. And apparently there's some controversy around this because people who know what they're talking about, like you and geology, knew that this picture was not right in some way. Can you fill us in on this? Yeah, so, and, and this is not terribly unusual in the art world, and in some ways you have to ask the question uh, when you're doing landscape art, are you trying to be true to the landscape, to the rocks, the animals, the plants that are there, or are you trying to convey something else? And I, I can't speak to what was going through Beerstead's mind as he was trying to paint that. I think the controversy in it is he probably wasn't as familiar with the terrain as he could have been. I like to liken it uh, to the fact that it's between, it's a conversation between you and who's viewing the art. Uh, and there is some license permitted if you both agree that that's acceptable. So if you're willing to, to paint a landscape and uh, insert something that doesn't belong there. If it's part of a fantasy or, or some kind of imaginative scale that you had in your brain and that's what you want to convey, that's certainly okay. If your point is to try to depict something realistic that you want your viewer to say that's what it really looks like, 
then you need to be true to what's going on. There are a lot of good examples of geology being represented into to, to art, and there are a lot of egregious examples where the artist uh, took some license with it because they weren't there and maybe they had uh, you know, the best information they could work with. There's a famous painting of Mount St. Helens erupting in the mid-1800s uh, where you, know, you ask a geologist, they would clearly tell you Mount St. Helens, the volcano, did not erupt that way at that time. Uh, but it does express the fact that there was an eruption at that time that's recorded. So there is value in that art, and there's quite a bit of license in how it's presented. But it certainly gets the flavor that something dynamic is happening in the Earth. So you can look at it one of two ways, I think. So am I correct, then, in saying that the three of you have the same moral outrage that I have when I watch the movie Twister, that things aren't quite just the real, the real way they are? Uh, yeah, I, I think I could probably get everybody to concur on that. Um, Kevin's asking if you're outraged when movies misdepict <laughs> earth processes and sciences. And again, I mean, what I, I think about that is in a lot of cases, um, particularly a natural disaster movie, is asking the audience to buy in that the natural disaster is happening and they want it to happen on a fast time scale with the, the protagonist, you know, getting, not Sharknado, that's, that's taking it to a, an obvious artistic license. But, but a movie like, uh, and these are, are from, you know, the, the big uh, blockbuster movie era around 2000, like The Core Volcano uh, or Dante's Peak, uh, they get a lot of the science incorrect in that and it really, where it, it sort of um, hits on me is saying we haven't done a good enough job talking about the science so that most people look at that and say, wait, that's wrong. My, my belief is suspended because uh, it suspends my belief. That's the problem. That's why we have the outrage. It's like, oh, that's all wrong. You can't do that. That's not the way the earth acts. Uh, and we're outraged by that. But the person sitting next to me has no idea that that's outrageous. They are not outraged by it. They're still fully involved in the film. And I would like to get us to a point where everybody in the theater understands, oh, that's not the way the Earth works. Can you do it a little more realistically? And they could. It's, it's not hard to do, I think, in many instances. And we've seen some, some examples where things are better than others. Uh, and certainly, I think, you know, it's possible that if the entire audience is aware of what's suspending their, their disbelief, then we can have an, an active conversation in a lot of these films about how the Earth really works. Well, we're about out of time. Give us a comment or two, closing comment, and you can uh, include your colleagues there about the intersection of art and science. Okay, so a couple of closing comments about the intersections of art and science from Amber and Jared. We'll go with Amber first. So where do you see art and science coming together? You've done both, actually. <laughs> um, actually, my minor, uh, I was originally engineering, and my minor was art. Um, and I don't know, I think we've touched on it a little bit today, like landscape drawings, landscape um, painting, of course, has a good intersection. Um, we use art in our class a lot um, for not just drawing cross sections, but also drawing. Um, I mean, if you take the time to draw a rock, you learn more about it than just taking a picture of it. So it actually makes you, using art with the geology makes you learn much more about what you're working with than if you just, ah, I took a picture of it. So I think it's... Um, I think there is a good intersection. Um, I'm sure Jared has better examples than me. Well, whenever I think about intersections between geology and art, I also think of uh, science in general. The main thing about um, art and science is that you're taking what you see and you're thinking about it critically and coming up with your own viewpoint of that. Art, you can put it down and ha have it so that other people can actually see what you envisioned. Same thing with geology. We need art to be able to convey these uh, these feelings and uh, insights that we have into what we think the Earth is doing at certain points. Um, that that ability to think critically and then be able to share those ideas with other people and compare ideas, you know, come to conclusions is one of the most important cross uh, cross sections cross sections. Uh, between art and geology that I can really think of. Very good. Dr. Price, a closing thought from you, and then we'll let you guys get out of the wind. 
Okay, well, thanks, Kevin. I agree with what both my students said. You, we utilize art to convey what we're trying to talk about in, in a simple uh, manifestation. Uh, and even at the highest level of scientific research, it's important to show something visual that people can re internalize and understand quickly and build models on. And I think is the same is true in the art world, that you're trying to build a framework that wasn't there before, that somebody else didn't see, and you're the first one there to expose them to it. And when you do that, that's where the real power is. You built on their imagination and your imagination jointly. And there's nothing, I think, more sort of sacred to the human endeavor than being able to build together as human beings and see jointly something that wasn't there before. It's just a beautiful trick of our minds. Fantastic stuff. And thank you so much, Dr. Price and Jared and Amber, for sharing with us the ingredients and inspiration for our art found in geology. And thanks to everybody for watching this virtual tour with special thanks to KFDX for making this possible. Join us again next month as we continue to explore how the arts and sciences work hand in hand. On behalf of Region 9 and the Kemp Center for the Arts, thank you again. Have a great day.